evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Ferndale City Council meeting for Monday, October 24th, 2011. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Council Members Baker. Here. Galloway. Here. Lennon. Piana. Here. Mayor Coulter. Here, yes, thank you. We have a quorum. Um, Councilman Lennon is uh, very much under the weather this evening, and so he has asked for an excused absence, if that's the will of the council. Is Would you like a motion or just a that, unanimous that consent? Unanimous consent. Hi. 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 Awesome. Well, so noted. Thank you. Uh, next item of business is the approval of the agenda. Are there any changes to our agenda this evening? Otherwise, a motion would be in order. I would move to approve the agenda as presented. Support? Moved by Baker, supported by Piana. Any discussion? Madam Clerk, call the roll. Council Members Baker. Here. Galloway. Yes. <laughs> yes. Piana. Still here. Yes. <laughs> Mayor Coulter. Yes, thank you. The agenda is approved. We have a number of presentations this evening. It's really the bulk of our agenda tonight. Uh, and I'd like to start by introducing... Uh, well, at least our County Commissioner, Craig Covey. I don't know if anyone is joining you uh, this evening, Commissioner Covey, but come on up for the always exciting distribution of the pub crawl proceeds. Oh, yes. Royale. Is this okay Good from evening. here? Of course. And I did. You know Royale Theus, Program Director, of Michigan AIDS Coalition, joining me tonight. And this is always one of our favorite things to do because, uh, well, second favorite after actually going on the pub crawl. <laughs> but as residents and folks, uh, most of you know, for the last 15 years, we have held a downtown pub crawl in Ferndale that not only provides a fun social opportunity, but supports the businesses. But most important, it raises money for charity. This year, again, uh, for the 15th year, we were very, very successful. Um, we had a total of 18 bars, clubs, and restaurants that were on the crawl. Sponsors, top sponsors included 42 Below, which is a vodka, uh, Boogie Fever, Dino's, Cantina Diablo's, Rosie O'Grady's, Danny's Irish Pub, and a, and a large number of other sponsors. Um, we had about 1,000 people who attended the crawl, including uh, several of you up there. Uh, Councilman Lennon is always helpful. The mayor was there traditionally to lead us off, the councilwoman. Um, Council members were there as well. So we thank you all for coming. Um, we netted $14,000 in proceeds, a little bit down from the previous year, um, but we are pleased tonight, and uh, Royale from uh, Michigan AIDS Coalition is going to help me distribute those proceeds. Um, we're going to hold off on one check for later. Um, we have $1,000 to give to the Ferndale Auxiliary Police, which we do every year because they are wonderful and we couldn't put on this crawl without them. Their annual recognition dinner is on November 5th. Yeah. So at that time, we will present that donation. Um, Royal, do you want to say anything from the Michigan mm -hmm. AIDS Coalition? Yes, thank you for having me. On the behalf of the Michigan AIDS Coalition, uh, our CEO, Helen Hicks, and Monica Mills, who couldn't be here, we'd like to thank all the volunteers and sponsors for without them, we would not be able to put on such a, a grand fundraiser and event. So again, thank you, and thank you for having me. Thanks, Royal. And again, we thank everybody in the city to help us. You know, in 15 years, there's never been a problem. We've never had a, any, any problems, no fights, no injuries. It's, it's just amazing, and it's really very thankful. So maybe we could have our representatives from the two charities come on up tonight, from uh, Dan Martin, the Ferndale Community Foundation, and Ann Heller from Fern Care. We, uh, we appreciate the work that you organizations do. You were two of the charities that selected to share in these proceeds. Thank you. Thank these you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have been very, very fortunate to have been chosen um, as one of the recipients for now. This is our third year, and so we are very pleased. Um, Without people like this, once again, I have to say, we would not have a free clinic in Ferndale. It is this kind of support from the community that allowed us to open. Thank you. Weren't you on the very first pub crawl 15 years ago? Yes, I was. <laughs> 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 okay. no, and I'm, I'm Dan Martin. On behalf of the Ferndale Community Foundation, I just want to uh, thank you. What, 
what we do with this money every year is we uh, take it and give it out in a grant cycle to projects that help enhance the quality of life for the residents of Ferndale. So uh, this money goes to very good work, and it's very good work that you do. So thank you so much for uh, including us in this great event. Thank you. Thank you kindly. Great. Thank you very much. Our next presentation this evening is an overview of the 12-hour shifts in the police department, and our police chief uh, is here to explain what's happening. Good evening, Your Honor, and thank you. Um, the city manager uh, requested that I present a overview of what the 12-hour shifts are going to look like beginning January 1st of next year. Uh, two of my challenges are, uh, she said, brief, and as we all know, I have difficulty in that area. <laughs> And the second part is, is that uh, I was helping my son with a physics uh, presentation, so you'll probably see a lot of whiz-bang stuff because I was showing him how to make the text uh, spin and turn and things. So, um, okay. begin with, we'll start with uh, where we are now and what, a, what our eight-hour shift scenarios look like. Um, the first thing, this is our current configuration. This is a uh, data sheet that we would look like um, for eight-hour shifts. <laughs> And as you can see, we, our officers all, all have rotating days off, and uh, the pink boxes up there represent uh, the days that they are off. The white ones represent the days that they work. And it's very confusing, and as we go on with the eight-hour shifts, it's going to sound like I'm dissing the eight-hour shifts, but understand that we have been working with these eight-hour shifts for over 30 years. They have worked very well for us, but uh, we're going to show you a couple of the things that we have problems with. Um, the first thing that we'll talk about is the rotating days off. Uh, because of the way they're configured, there's a different group of officers working every day. So you may have Officer A, B, and C working on one day. If you wanted to talk to him the next day, he may be on his days off. So you can see a different group of people working uh, every every day is a different uh, uh, scenario. Uh, the number of officers working also varies. Like because of the rotating shift, we may have six officers assigned to duty one day, and we may have four or five the next day. So it depends on what the rotation is. It also takes an officer 49 days to, to complete one Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, Act cycle. So in order for it to even out, like most people work a seven-day work week, in order for us to even out, it takes 49 days. It gets very confusing, It's and, and there's some very significant math problems that we have to go through to make sure that uh, they work 2,080 hours a year. Um, it also is difficult for us to schedule training in court because uh, if you have a static court day, if it's Thursday, say, uh, one officer may not be working uh, on a Thursday, and then we pay a premium to have them come in on their day off. So, it, And training is the same way. We don't get to, uh, to state when the trainings would be if we're sending an officer out to training could be on their day off if we want to send a specific officer. And also, uh, the officers are scheduled for only two weekends off in each six-week or 49-day cycle. So they get two weekends off every 49 days. So uh, continuing on with some of the rotating days off things, uh, some of the advantages are, though, it's easier to replace missing personnel due to, the, due to sickness, injury, or training because they're only on eight-hour shifts. It's also easier to hold officers over in an emergency because, because they're only working eight hours, we can hold them over in an additional four without impacting uh, uh, on uh, their time as much. Uh, the, one of the disadvantages, however, is that because of the rotating days, there's a smaller pool of available officers to fill these vacancies. And lastly, one of the things that uh, was brought up when we were talking about this is that fully one-third of the department, the ones that work on the midnight shift, uh, do not have the opportunity to engage the average citizen during routine times. These folks work straight midnights, and basically they don't talk to, uh, and I hate to say normal people, but because uh, there are normal people that are on midnights, but the average people they, they generally don't see at all. And the next topic on eight-hour shifts is unity of command. Now, this is an important thing because right now we have three command officers per shift, one lieutenant and two sergeants. There are a total of nine command officers in our patrol division right now. Uh, command officers, because of the rotating shifts, also only work together one day every eight days. So the only time we have three actually working is one in every one of their one day of every their eight day cycle. 
And it also gives us uh, some difficulty because of the rotating days is that when we conduct in-service training that we do in-house or we present orders or instruction, it must be done several times because, like I said, these officers don't work the same day, uh, the same group of days every, every uh, week. And some of the quality of life issues, these officers work a six day, two, six day on, two day off, uh, 49 day uh, cycle. That can get, uh, you know, kind of old after a while. Uh, the days off rotate each week, and that means that they may be off on Monday, Tuesday, the next week they're off Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Wednesday, Thursday, so they never have the same two days off. And uh, most people work Monday through Friday, and so do their families, and so do the type of things that, you know, go on normally through schools and things of that nature. So the family life and the time with their children is impacted by the schedule. The afternoon shift and the midnight shift officers are further impacted by the hours of, that they work as well. Um, and statistics have shown that officers that work these, the shift work, uh, their health can be impacted uh, by this uh, type of uh, shift schedule. Now here's our new configuration. And you're going to see it's the same document, we're using the same software, but if you see that everything there is all lined up in little boxes and everything looks the same. You'll see that there are four, um, there are four platoons. We don't call them ships, we call them platoons. There's two day shift platoons and there's two night shift platoons. And when one day shift uh, platoon is working, the other day shift platoon is off and vice versa on the, on the uh, night shift. Uh, these officers still rotate, but all the personnel on one platoon work at the same time. So those groups are always together. There's not gonna be a rotating days off when, when, when uh, day shift A is on, they're all on. In the platoon system, it only takes 14 days to complete a FLSA cycle compared to the 49 days in the current configuration. Like I stated, there's four platoons, two days, two nights. They start, one, day starts at 7 a.m., ends at 7 p.m., and night starts at 7 p.m. And, and ends at 7 a.m. <clears throat> there's also a larger pool of officers to replace personnel that are absent due to sickness, injury, or training. Instead of those few that, are, uh, that happen to be on their days off, there's a fully one half of the department that will be on a day off and they are available for a call in if necessary. <clears throat> However, one of the disadvantages is it may be challenging to hold officers more than four hours in an emergency because they're already working 12. We feel that it would be too much to ask to have them more than 16. So that is gonna be one of the challenges that we'll be working through. <clears throat> Continuing now with the platoon system. We also have, like I stated, consist, consistent staffing levels. These officers will they'll all be there at one time for each platoon. So we know we'll have the same number of personnel that are scheduled to work every day for every shift. Um, it will be easy to schedule officers for court. And we are working with the court right now, and the court has agreed to have a night court for us. We think it's going to be an advantage to the citizens, wow. and it's mm. going to be an advantage to the officers. And we're pretty sure that it's going to lower our cost for calling officers into court. So I think it's going to be one of our advantages. Um, and to the officers' advantage, they are scheduled for one weekend off every two weeks. So with their cycle in that period of time, they will actually get uh, every other weekend off. <coughs> and in our unity command, similar to what we spoke of before, now we will have even though we have four platoons, we will actually lessen the number of command officers that we have for the uh, patrol division. We have two command officers per platoon, one lieutenant and one sergeant. That's a total of eight as opposed to nine in the current configuration. That means there's one less uh, op uh, command officer position that we have on the department. Uh, we believe that this will streamline communication, both verbal and written, because everybody on the platoon works at the same time, so they will only have to repeat orders or instructions at one particular uh, briefing. And it will also streamline in-service training because everybody on the platoon will all be there at the same time, so we could, uh, if we had shooting training, they will all be there that day, and we can get it done in one day, so it would be more efficient for us as well. And in the quality of life, even though the night platoons will still be away from their families at unconventional times from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., they will be here 22% less shifts. They will drive to the police station 22 less times than they do now. 
and, and uh, one of the officers uh, actually already figured it out and it's going to save him fifteen hundred dollars in gas. <laughs> so, so, wow. Um, both national as well as, local, as well as local opinions favor 12-hour shifts. They feel that their quality of life is, has, uh, is improved by this configuration, and our hope is that we will have an improved performance from our officers. Uh, and lastly, one of the things that we talked about before is that now all officers will be working at a period of time where they will engage the average, average citizens for at least part of their shift. Because they, they come in at 7, they'll still talk to uh, the, uh, the regular folks uh, during that 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. period of time. And lastly, we did have some unintended advantages. And um, we have so far uh, seen a increased uh, morale among our employees because of this configuration. And we have improved cooperation between management and the unions. We've had uh, excellent uh, uh, discussions on how this is going to work. We've had very little conflict. And we have agreed that there will be no grievances filed while we are in this one-year trial period, while we are trying to work through any type of, uh, of misunderstandings or issues that we haven't foreseen. And lastly, if you notice this one's in green, we have reduced our <laughs> carbon footprint because the number of officers, uh, because the officers will not be driving to work 22 per, uh, percent less time. We will be having less gasoline use, less uh, things of that nature. So I also have, if there's any questions, I put side by side the 12 hour shift and the uh, eight hour shift so you see what the mess the one is and what, how straight and neat and nice the other one looks. Is there any questions? Well, thank you, Chief. Uh, that, that pretty graphically uh, shows why it's simpler. Let me ask you one question. You talk about this FLSA cycle going from 49 days to 14 days. What is the advantage of that? What? Well, it's, it's more mostly an advantage to uh, administration because uh, we are able to, um, if we change someone's shift to from, uh, even change their number within their shift, their, their cycle within their shift, they have, uh, we have to go through a long uh, process of figuring out how much time they are owed or how much time they owe us, and then they have to work an extra day or we may have to give them an extra day. So it is, uh, it's, it's more of an administrative advantage for us. It's easier to keep track of things. Okay. Uh, the, in the 12 hour shift scenario, for every day you work, you earn a day off. That's how it works, it's very simple. Great. Any questions of counsel? When did this go in effect again? This will go in effect on January 1st. January 1. It will be a one-year trial. And how long did it take you to get to this point? I mean, how, what was your development period of, of the switch? When did you start? Well, we started with when we began contract negotiations. This is um, one of the issues that the patrol union wanted very, very much. And um, our Resistance against it was uh, primarily because uh, our command officer union wasn't so sure that they wanted to do it at first. And um, I, I didn't want to have a system where we had one group on eights and one group mm -hmm. on twelves. So command, um, who really didn't want to go to twelves, they're kind of the older guys, they acquiesced and said, okay, we'll give this a try as well. And then we began the, uh, and this was really how we got uh, one of the, the carrot and sticks that got us the, uh, the union to uh, take concessions and go through uh, the contract negotiations when we did it. So we've been, we've been going to school on this for about eight months now, figuring okay. it out. Other questions? Chief, thanks a lot. I appreciate fantastic. the explanation. Uh, the next presentation is uh, called the Backpack Program, and that's mine. So let me just briefly explain what this is about. Um, when I became mayor back in January, I began looking into starting this program as a way to both highlight what I think is a really neat and successful program in Ferndale and also to support the kids that participate in it. And that's our Head Start program. I don't know how many folks know, but Ferndale has four Head Start classrooms over at Grant Early Education Childhood Center, formerly Grant Elementary School. Uh, and these are three and four year old students who are low income, uh, um, who come from families with need. 
Uh, but educators have, I think, now discovered that kids that do preschool uh, have a much better success rate when they get to kindergarten and first grade than those who do not. And so it's important that even kids from disadvantaged families have the opportunity to go to a preschool. And Head Start is a federal program that we have in Ferndale. It's run through a partnership with Oakland Livingston Human Services Agency, which is right across the street over on Nine Mile, and the Ferndale Public Schools. And as I said, there's four classrooms of Head Start kids over in Grand Elementary. And so uh, a program that I had been involved in in another community and, and did this, I wanted to bring to Ferndale, and that's this, to, to supply every kid in Head Start with a brand new backpack full of school supplies and necessities that they would need to have a good, good Head Start in their Head Start year. And uh, the community was amazingly generous. I had more people volunteer to, to fill backpacks than I had backpacks. Uh, next year, I may even want to expand the program. There's 68 Head Start kids, but there's another 100 kids at Grant Elementary in this age group that we could expand it to. So we'll see. We took a small step this year and did the 68. But uh, I want to I want to just take a moment this evening to recognize the folks who helped uh, make this program a success. Uh, first of all. Uh, we couldn't have done the program if it wasn't for the Ferndale Community Foundation, and um, they are represented this evening by Dan Martin, their president. The Ferndale Community Foundation, through a grant, paid for all the brand new backpacks for the kids. So that was just awesome. Um, um, also, uh, Oakland Livingston Human Services Agency is the operator of Head Start in, Fern in Ferndale, and I was on their board for many years. I'm uh, such a proud supporter of the group. Lynn Crotty is here representing ULSA, and I'm going to... When I'm done, I'm going to ask all of these representatives to come up and just model with one of the backpacks. I actually want to just show off what they look like because they're really adorable. Um, and then we had four community groups that volunteered to sort of adopt a classroom and take the backpacks for those kids and get them filled with essential items. And those items are things like crayons and coloring books, toothpaste and toothbrush, um, underwear, things that the kids are going to need to to get off on the right foot, and um, a, a reading book, uh, heavy in reading. We want to make sure our kids get off and uh, uh, know how to read by the time they get to kindergarten, so that's very important as well. So we had four community organizations that agreed to do this. Some of them are represented here, and some of them I don't think their representatives made it, but uh, the First Baptist Church of Ferndale was one of the first groups to call me, uh, and Reverend Renee Garcia and Shirley Wade are both here uh, from the First Baptist Church of Ferndale. I want to thank you very much for and all your congregants for helping, and I'll have you come up in a minute. Um, a group of engaged parents from Kennedy and Roosevelt schools uh, that was coordinated, this won't surprise anybody, by Kevin and Bridget Deegan Krause, who are very active in our schools. And they got a group of, a group of the parents uh, that are engaged in those schools to adopt the classroom. In addition, Credit Union One uh, adopted one of the classrooms, and Drayton Avenue Presbyterian Church also adopted one. I don't see Ken. We might have you be the representative from Drayton this evening. Um, so if you folks would just come on up, I'm going to have, I'm going to show you what the backpacks look like, and then we'll maybe take a picture for posterity, I suppose. Oh, there's the little. Oh. I mean, three and four year olds. We're talking brand new, absolutely adorable backpacks. So take one. Please, out of the, I think I have enough for most of us. I like this one. Uh -huh. I don't know how many I need. We may need to share. Come on over here. I promised my photographer friend that we would give him an opportunity to take a picture. But these are the folks that made this program happen. And as a result, all of our Head Start kids are going to have brand new backpacks this year. So, very, very cool. Yeah, come on, Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> bunch in a little bit. Bunch in, bunch in. There we go. Now do a funny one. <laughs> if you'd like to say anything into the mic, please. I mean, say it in the mic so the folks can hear. Thanks, Reverend. On behalf of First Baptist Church, it was an honor. For the American Baptist women and the American Baptist men to get involved in this. 
and we're looking forward to being involved in it next year, and we're hoping the program continues and that we get greater involvement. Thank you for the opportunity. Anybody else wants to say a hello or a shout out? You're more than welcome. Yeah. I'm from Cuddy, New Orleans, and uh, Dave contacted us back in August. I think I was on vacation at that point, and I was getting caught up when I got back, and basically our response was, you know, how many, where, and what, and when do you need it? So great program. You can't beat helping kids out and the educational side. So it's uh, I, how anybody would even say no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously nobody did. Thank you. I'm John Kovitz from Credit Union One. I think I forgot to mention your name earlier. But thanks, everybody. Much, much appreciated. All right. Now back in the box, we have to give them a Thanks again, Thank you. Very appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so hopefully that will become an annual tradition, uh, thanks to the generosity of those folks and everybody else in the community who took a backpack, took it to the store, and filled it with all the stuff for the kids. Thanks, everybody. All right, our next presentation this evening is from our Downtown Development Authority. And Chris Hughes, are you here on behalf of the DDA this evening? I am indeed. Good evening, and I'm looking for my, trying to get out of the uh, Chief's presentation, because I, that was nice, nicely done, but boy, I wouldn't have to, like to have to line up all those columns. Anyway, um, hang on here, I'm sorry, I'll get this up, but yes, I am from the DDA, and we have lots of stuff happening. Hold this one. So that would be enough about me right there. We have been, the DDA has been busy welcoming, welcoming lots of new businesses. Um, I've gone over them before, but we officially welcome 8 Degrees Plato on Friday. They are a craft beer store. They've got all kinds of cool stuff. They opened up on um, just on West 9, just east of Livernoy. So keep track of them. It's a very cool place. We also... Uh, welcome to Back on Board, Red Hook and Pinwheel Bakery. If you've been dying for some good baked goods, Pinwheel is back open again. And joining them is some really great coffee. Fern Care, of course, opened up. And today we just had the pleasure of opening up the Fine Jewelry and Gift Gallery at the corner of Woodward and Nine. And that is Zari Marcosian and his family. It's a great little store. We're happy to welcome, really, it's Ferndale's first jewelry store in downtown Ferndale. So... That was a great day for everybody, and still to come uh, on the on the business things, we've got Kimberly Maternity, Woodward Imperial, uh, John D's, which is the old club bar. We've got all kinds of great stuff coming. The DDA has also been busy work organizing and promoting events. On Thursday, October 27th, we've got Scaring for Caring at Rosie O'Grady's. That's a a uh, fundraiser. They have done amazing scarecrows. I encourage everybody to go in and take a look at what that staff has put together for scarecrows. On Friday, October 28th, we have some sp spectacular fun at the uh, library featuring Dan the Creature Man, which I think is definitely worth a venture out to see what Dan is up to. That's from 6.30 p.m. at the library. On Saturday, October 29th, from 10 to 11, the Elks are hosting um, at the Coolidge Center, the Help Elks are hosting a special needs trick-or-treat party. And from 4 to 7 in downtown Ferndale, our merchants have gotten together, and they'll be handing out candy to uh, costume kids and their parents. And those same kids can head on over to Rust Belt Market where there will be a costume contest and also a costume contest for pets, presumably ones that can walk and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, there's a lot going on this weekend for trick-or-treat, and there's plenty of good reasons to come on downtown. This week, we are, we've been busy. We will be busy helping businesses. We are going to be talking trash this Wednesday, October 26th at FernNet um, from 9 to 10 a.m. at the Torino Espresso Bar. And we're going to be talking trash because we have a representative from Sakura coming. And she will be sharing how businesses can get recycling bins at their business and put them to good use and keep the good green going in downtown Ferndale. That's every last Wednesday of the month from 9 to 10. It's FernNet Business to Business. We invite everybody that's in business to come on and join us. And if you're not in business, you can still come. We, we don't send anybody away. 
We are also planning on changing the future, or charting the future, sorry. We will have, the DDA will have an open house on Wednesday, November the 9th, from 6.30 to 8 p.m. at Blooms by JR Designs at 503 East Nine Mile Road. And the reason that you see a picture of a, our great pedestrian alley there is that we're going to be talking about East Nine Mile. We want to know what our residents and our businesses in that district think about what things are working there and what things need improvement and what can we do to make that part of town better for not only our businesses but for our residents who of course that's who we are ultimately serving here is providing them with a great downtown so everybody's invited to come and put in their two cents worth we very much welcome that we've had a couple of those we'll be having more in each quadrant and Finally, we have been very busy getting our downtown, hometown holidays together. Um, the one to put on your calendar to start things off is November 17th. We're going to have a Light the Town. And uh, we have lots of businesses involved in that. They'll be decorating their stores with holiday trees and lots of lights and all kinds of fun stuff. I'll just run through these quickly because you'll be hearing more from me as we go on. But... Um, November 26th is a small biz Saturday. December 3rd, we're going to have the Wings and Wishes uh, Make-A-Wish Tree Lighting. December 9th, 10th, and 11th is going to be great. Holiday Ice and Winterfest Market. We are enhancing our, our Holiday Ice Program to um, include a Winterfest Market, which will be holiday decors, and a Ferris wheel is coming to town along with a little train that kids can ride. It's going to be awesome. Uh, December 15th is Merry Midnight Madness for late night shopping. December 19th, 17th, Men's Night Out. And if we make it to December 31st, it'll be New Year's Eve. And something special is planned for that, but we're still working on it. And that is all I have to say. All the details all the time at downtownferndale.com or visit us on our Facebook. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Lots going on with our downtown. <laughs> That's worthy of applause. Thanks, Chris. Uh, our final presentation tonight is uh, from our Economic Development Director, Derek Delacourt, who's going to give us an overview of what's going on in his world. Good evening, Derek. Uh, good evening. Let's see if I can get this uh, up and running as well here. We are here for a couple of reasons tonight. Um, the first is to talk to council about what it is we've been doing over the last six months or so since uh, I've been here. Uh, I do not have as many bells and whistles as the chief, and unlike him also, I took the city manager's uh, suggestion seriously, and I'm going to be as brief as possible here. Um, we are here for a couple of reasons. The first... <laughs> Microphone's not working, or is it? it is, I will be loud. Hopefully, everybody can hear me. <laughs> um, we're here for a couple of reasons tonight. The first is to give you an update on what we've been uh, doing over the last six months, what we've been focusing, focusing on as a department, um, and what we plan on doing over the next few months. Uh, the second part of it is is to give a brief presentation about an actual project um, that we've been working on. That uh, the results are just about complete, and we are at this point very happy with. And I have. Uh, one of the consultants here with me that uh, helped work on it, and we'll give you a quick presentation on what that project is and what we anticipate doing with it. Um, first off, what we are doing. Um, over the last six months, we have worked extremely hard to uh, continue to improve the business-friendly atmosphere that's here in the city. Um, it's something that was established before I got here, certainly something that the uh, DDA has uh, promoted in the downtown, and we have focused on extending that attitude um, outside of the downtown to through the rest of the city, specifically focusing on the manufacturing, industrial, um, and office community uh, throughout the city. Um, one of the things we've done and, and focused on early to facilitate that is to streamline our review process. Um, over the last six months, we've been instituted a free concept plan review process in which any applicant, uh, whether it's a new development or an addition, or for whatever reason can come in and sit down with us, uh, myself, the building official, the fire marshal, and any other department, including DPW, that uh, is necessary to review a, uh, a project um, before they actually spend any money on it, before they submit for permits, before they submit for fees. Um, it's been something that's been relatively popular so far. And from my point of view, I'd like to thank, I know Byron's here, and, and I, don't, I didn't see anybody from the fire department, but all the staff um, has been extremely uh, 
gracious in accommodating that request um, and taking their time out to meet with applicants, to meet with business owners, to work with them on their projects, and to try to uh, point out any major issues before they spend any money or time on it. Um, in addition to that, we've coordinated pre-certificate of occupancy walkthroughs, simplified the permit and uh, permit process and fee schedule, and begun to issue temporary CFOs um, to businesses and instances where uh, maybe they haven't dotted every I and crossed every T in the building code, but in an effort to get them up and running, um, we're allowing them to open up and then providing time frames or accepting time frames to uh, finish the final items that may be necessary. Um, we've uh, attempted through these, these practices to eliminate op obstacles to reinvestment and redevelopment in the community, which is really our primary goal. And we've attempted to increase our participation in outside uh, agency groups. Oakland, Oakland County's Economic Development Group, um, we've been recently appointed to a SEMCOG task force that's in, uh, investigating green infrastructure and its impacts on economic development. So that is some of the general things we've been working on. Um, the major focus of the department and myself since I've been here is to uh, establish and, and, and really work on business retention. Um, I think everybody here is aware that uh, economic development, 80% of it, 90% of it, is to keep what you have, um, to encourage the businesses that are already in your community to reinvest. To that end, uh, we have started to schedule regular uh, retention visits with companies within the city. Um, we try to do a couple a week. Um, we're hoping to keep that schedule and actually pick up speed over the next six months. Um, we've tried to standardize how we collect information for companies. We are investigating with uh, a partnership with the DDA and the Eight Mile Boulevard Association um, to institute Salesforce.com, which is basically a cloud-based client management software that allows us to track uh, companies, um, their investment, and to share information with the state. It's a Michigan Economic Development Corporation pilot program and uh, we're looking to get involved in that. You'll be hearing more about that shortly. We should be back in front of council, hopefully, with a, a recommendation on how to install or institute that program. Um, the biggest thing for us was to establish partnerships with outside agencies on how we do re our retention program. Instead of each agency uh, interviewing or, or meeting with companies independently, um, we've established a process by with uh, companies that meet certain qualifications. The MEDC takes the lead, makes sure that all the other agencies are involved or invited to those meetings. Uh, everything else, we take the lead. But we ensure that everybody uh, is invited to those meetings, and that's in an attempt to keep uh, companies from being inundated from multiple groups at multiple times. Um, we found it to be appreciated, and so far it's worked out very well. And at every meeting with every company, our, our message is consistent. What can we do to help? What programs do we have that can be of service to you? And how do we help your company grow and, and continue to invest in Ferndale? Um, our basic strategy as a department is one that I think is shared pretty universally throughout the state right now, talking about economic gardening, um, big reason that uh, you know we focus so hard on retention. Um, it's designed to to work with our, our companies that may be looking to grow, um, to continue to provide tools to local companies to reinvest. Um, and this is a, a, a strategy or a mantra you're going to hear from me over and over again. Um, but the idea is to identify companies that may be those second stage companies within the city and then connect with them to provide the resources and tools they need to expand and grow. Um, you'd be surprised at how many business owners and companies, and, and, and maybe not many of you have worked with them in the past, um, get so busy in the day-to-day -day operations of their company that they don't take the time necessary to look into how they want to expand, what, what they need to expand, and what tools are available for their expansion. Our job is to, is to meet with them, provide those tools, um, and really to work um, to keep them here. The second part of that is to fo focus on um, maybe not so much normal economic development tools or what are perceived as normal tools, and that is to really to continue to work on the quality of life initiatives in the city of Ferndale. I think it's something that this council is very familiar with. Um, issues that make Ferndale a good place to live, strong sense of community, strong sense of place. Um, those type of issues go as far as any uh, normal abatement tool or tax abatement tool that you could ever use. Um, and we continue to incorporate those into our day-to-day -day operations and make sure people understand it's not just um, the companies, but it's the neighborhoods, the school system, and we, and we continue to try to build those partnerships. 
Um, to that end, uh, we are working to, and, and, and to do that, these are some of the tools we're focused on right now. Um, Oakland County has a, a, has a small arsenal of loans and, and equipment available for uh, companies to expand and grow within Oakland County. Uh, we try to make sure that the companies are aware of what is out there and uh, how to have access to them. Uh, we regularly work with the MEDC um, to put entrepreneurs in contact with the tools that can help them grow their businesses. Uh, Ferndale is a fantastic place for small companies, for entrepreneurs to get started. Um, it has a spirit here that uh, is not seen in a lot of other communities, and we're really trying to work to expand that. Um, to that end, uh, we're considering uh, utilizing the MORE program. It's, uh, it's something that's already in place on the DDA website. Um, we would certainly like to consider putting it in place on the city's website. It is a database-driven tool that allows uh, entrepreneurs to connect with other local entrepreneurs and identify resources that they may have in common um, to help them grow their businesses. Um, some of the other small projects or other projects we're working on, and I think Council is familiar with this, the City received a Quality of Life Award from the Oakland County Business Roundtable. Um, this goes directly to that sense of place type uh, recognition. Um, we are working with the Chamber and the School District right now on a, on a plan that identifies, um, it, it basically measures the City of Ferndale against a series of benchmarks that are established by the Oakland County Business Roundtable. Um, we'll finalize that plan and uh, identify what it is we do well and where we can make improvements versus those benchmarks, develop an implementation plan. Um, there is, and I'm, I'm pleased to announce there's a awards presentation that will be December 9th at the yearly or the annual Oakland, Oakland County Business Roundtable uh, breakfast where the city, a representative from the city and mayor hopefully are available, um, the representative from the school district and the, and the chamber will, will receive award, an award for uh, the work they've done in this area. So that's December 9th. And then uh, we will be presenting the plan to the round table some type in, some type, uh, some sometime in early February. So hopefully, uh, hopefully that will come together uh, quickly. Another program we've been working on is we partnered with uh, Southfield, the MEDC, and Royal Oak on uh, what we're tentatively call calling the Southeast Michigan Peer Opportunities event. Um, it's taken on several forms already, but the basic idea is uh, MEDC will um, put together about 200 graduate level college students and bus them into the community, into Southeast Michigan. Um, the idea is to put uh, local students in contact with local companies. Um, Southfield has taken the lead on it, uh, but we believe, and, and in working with them in the city of Royal Oak, there's a real synerg synergy between some of the companies and, and opportunities that are available in Southfield and the live work type a relationship that Royal Oak, Ferndale, and some of the other communities along the Woodward Corridor share with Southfield. So we hope to do that in early April. Um, logistically, it's, it's daunting. Um, we're hoping, obviously, that the DDA will be involved in it. We think that plays a big role in uh, why people and why uh, graduate level students or, or young professionals uh, would love to live in Ferndale. And uh, hopefully that will come together sometime in early April. Um, the environmental concerns inventory, this was the real focus over the last six months. You're going to hear more about this in a little bit. Um, it was really an, an inventory or an analysis of about 200 parcels within the city, um, all manufacturing industrial parcels uh, within two defined districts. Um, the idea of the inventory is to evaluate those parcels and identify any impediments to redevelopment, um, identifies ways to maximize the development of those parcels, and then identify tools that can assist in doing that. And like I said, your second part of our presentation here will focus on, on the inventory. Um, we are having a positive impact. Um, these things are not all due, to, obviously, to our involvement, um, but we do believe that the environment here plays a big role in it. Obviously, Council is aware of Garden Fresh's uh, continued investment in the community um, and that partnership, and we think the, the perception of uh, Ferndale as a, a place to do business and a friendly place to grow um, played a huge role in their decision to consolidate their operations here and invest uh, considerably uh, more money. Brass Aluminum Forging is a great story. Actually, they are a uh, manufacturing company on Jarvis. Um, very first company I met with after coming here. Actually, they were signing a lease with a, with a, for a new building 
um, in another community I won't mention where. And they were under the assumption that they would not be able to expand in a way necessary to bring in a new press. And it was only through going out and meet with them that we found out they were doing that. Um, we took a look at what it was they wanted to do. Um, we quickly identified a way for them to expand. Um, it doesn't involve, it didn't create many new jobs, only about 10 new jobs. Um, they are manufacturing jobs. Um, they did uh, build a sizable addition to their building and brought in a $700,000 press that they needed to expand their operation. Um, that press is being assembled now um, and the company is still here. So I think that goes to the importance of getting out and, and meeting the companies that were, are within your community. Um, another one, we're working with uh, what everybody is aware is a, a relatively successful entrepreneurial story, and that's uh, Valentine Vodka. Um, they're looking to invest a considerable amount more uh, in their facility over the next two years. Uh, we're working with them to try to find a way to maximize that through any type of local incentives we have um, and to ensure that that money stays here in the city. Um, and on a general basis, we, we just are working hard to continue to improve the perception of Ferndale um, as a great place to do business and invest. Next steps, uh, we are working with the city manager's office, hopefully to focus in, in a similar way um, to the next presentation you'll see, but on the Livernois Vester, Vester and Hilton corridors. Um, we think, and I, I, I think it's well known throughout the community that those are corridors we feel that there can be reasonable new investment, expansion. Some of it's already underway, and we are working uh, hard to find uh, new ways to encourage that investment. Um, continue to expand and grow our retention program. Um, for me, that's the most important thing. The more companies we get out and meet on a, on a daily basis, the better we're doing. Um, we would like to, and this is going to run contrary to one of the arguments I sat and actually made here at City Council, but simplify the fee schedule and the bonds. Uh, we did increase the bonds too much, um, and the, the pendulum has swung too far the other way. I think it was Ms. Baker who had that concern, and it turns out that that was probably an accurate concern. So we'll be back in front of you either mm -hmm. the next time the fee schedule comes. But, and again, in, a, in an effort to try to simplify and standardize our process, um, we're going to continue to streamline things. And then um, working with the clerk's department on improving our electronic service delivery, our website, social media, and those things. Hopefully those are all things that will be coming in short order the next six months or so. So. With that, and maybe I wasn't as brief as I thought I was going to be, but um, certainly if you have any questions on specifically what our department's doing, what I'm doing, we can answer those now. Um, if not, um, we can move on to the next part of the presentation. I just had questions. Oh, I have comments. comments. Yes. This is exactly what we envisioned um, a year ago when we came up with uh, restructuring this um, job. Uh, your position, and I am so I'm just tickled pink with what you're doing. Um, your creativity is just showing through, and I, I hear it out in the in the world with businesses, um, the impact that you're having. So um, exactly what we had envisioned, and it, it's just fantastic to see it unfold. Well, it's not just Eric; his staff gets one well, of yes. reviews too, yes. and yes. Um, you know, sort of passing along some thanks from Fern Care, which I've conveyed to you personally, but, but to your, your building inspector as well. Mark did a fantastic job with exactly what you described as that temporary certificate of occupancy process. Um, being able to have everything in place to open a facility and then finish up the last few you know, things that don't necessarily impact health or safety but are required by the city um, of, to be able to move forward with your business, um, in our case, to start seeing patients. Um, was it was wonderful, and so it's not just Derek, but but it's his staff too that you've really motivated um, to to work in new ways and to be excited about the job. Yeah, and I, and really, I shouldn't have left that to someone else to bring up. Um, specifically, Mark Howell, the city's building official. Um, I, the city has a real um, gem in him. In the six months I've been here, um, he is someone who's willing to do everything, to be flexible. Um, everything from inspections to plan review. He, he is absolutely someone in, in this day and age that is a, a huge, um, of huge importance to the city with his ability to do multiple tasks, um, not complain about him, and just do whatever is necessary for the city to move forward. He's been a, a real joy. And the rest of our staff, uh, Carrie and, and Kathy and, and our code enforcement guys, Joe and Ken, um, Tammy, the rental inspector, everybody has embraced the concept of providing improved client services, improved customer services, um, and really has had an attitude of we'll do whatever it takes to try to improve that. So thank you for mentioning it.
And Derek, just a question. Could you go into a little bit more detail on the Vester, Hilton, and Livernoy corridor and, and what you might be Great expecting? Question. Yeah. Um, it, for all three corridors, uh, let me start with Livernoy. Um, in looking at that, there's, it's really a twofold um, implementation, I think, that needs to be examined. Um, one is from an infrastructure standpoint. I don't think it's any uh, surprise to the council. We'd like to reevaluate uh, how the road works, um, identify areas for additional parking, public parking um, along the corridor. Um, for those businesses to grow, you have some uh, absolutely wonderful you know, post-World War II industrial type buildings that are just ripe for adaptive reuse, um, but you lack parking um, to, for that growth. So to identify an, an infrastructure fix where maybe we partner with private development or take a look at uh, on-street parking on the Livernois corridor, um, which is taking place anyways. Um, you, can, you can see it um, happening with or without uh, uh, well, the we actual. We sort of decided to allow it. So. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's still uh, but we do that at one in end. It is restricted at one end. We just, you know, someone asked and so we had the chief take down all signs. Yeah. The, the other thing we've talked about and we've, uh, specifically with the city manager, is the implementation of some type of incentive district. Um, whether it's an Oprah district on a, uh, a quarter wide basis, and, and Oprah is an obsolete property rehabilitation um, district where you, you can actually have the ability to take an identified area and potentially freeze the taxes uh, for a certain amount of time. You continue to collect what you normally would, uh, the city's general fund in the normal jurisdictions, but you can freeze any increase over a certain period of time as a, as a way to encourage investment within a specific district. Um, we're not sitting here saying that that's the solution or the way to go, um, but that is one of the tools. Um, we are looking at from a local standpoint and from an overarching standpoint is we really think over the next six months that that's where we're going to focus our retention and um, partnership uh, visits with the county and with the MEDC is within those corridors to see if we can provide tools that would be helpful to the companies that have already located there. The city did a... a from a planning standpoint, went a long way with those districts already by implementing and adopting flexible zoning standards um, and, and really utilizing the Master Land Use Plan and the zoning ordinance to, to get the ball rolling, um, in which it has been. I think, I think there's a lot of interest in that area, um, and, but for the economy, I think you would have seen a lot more investment in both of those areas by now. Um, a couple of things. Well, first of all, thank you for all of your efforts that you've done. I, I, I meet with a lot of business owners, and the first question I always ask them is, how has the city been to deal with? And I have been pleasantly surprised. I don't know if I had old perceptions or what, but I've been pleasantly surprised that the answer is, you know, always very, very positive. And so appreciate how you represent our community to the, to the businesses. A couple of things I just want to mention in your program. One, the, the, the MORE program. Uh, that piece is coming to the city website when I was at the MML conference. Um, I actually did the video and they're in the process of setting up agreements. You should be getting that uh, if I haven't mentioned that to you. So that'll be on our website soon, uh, which is cool. And then the second thing I just wondered is, I remember a couple of years ago when I was the county commissioner, um, uh, I asked Oakland County about how they could help us market industrial uh, properties in Ferndale and they said well we need to know what they are first and we don't have an up-to-date inventory of what you have you know a lot of times when a business comes to Oakland County they don't go to all 63 <laughs> cities villages and townships they go to the county um, is that still the case or do we have a, a, an updated sort of vacancy <laughs> Tonight, but do we have a, a, a vacancy list that we regularly share with the county, or could we do that, something like that? Yeah, we, we do keep a, a vacant property uh, update list. I'm not sure how often by process we share it with the county, um, but I can certainly get in contact with both their economic development group and the, the planning group to find out um, if they don't have it, what's the best, mean and how, best means and how regularly they'd like to see that. Great. That'd be helpful. Thank you. So you have a part two? Or? I do, All right. <laughs> which is actually the better of the two parts. So, um, yeah, you don't want the, the report? Come on up. Uh, we have been working in a partnership with the county, oddly enough. Um, the county has some, in, 
EPA, EPA assessment money left over that was part of a coalition grant that was granted, and, and Ferndale was part of that coalition with a few other communities. Um, and the money needed to be spent. It had been uh, being utilized on an individual parcel basis for phase ones, phase twos, um, which, is, which is exactly what it's intended for, to do environmental investigation. Um, we started talking about a way we could use that money for a bigger, a bigger bang, basically. Um, and what we decided to do was that maybe we could focus on two very specific areas in the city that had a mash of industrial properties, um, potentially functionally obsolete properties, potentially blighted properties, and areas in the city that maybe if we could uh, do some of the legwork or, or individual due diligence uh, up front, that we could start to focus a spotlight on and hopefully encourage some redevelopment of. To that end, what you have in front of you is the environmental concerns inventory. Um, it's a project that is designed to do that. It's uh, to steal Tom's term, and I'm sure he was going to use it. Here at the what, phase one on steroids is what <laughs> we've, we've called it in the past. Um, and it attempts to identify issues that may be out there with each one of these individual parcels ahead of time um, so developers don't have to spend their own money and, and property owners don't have to spend their own money on the due diligence. So. Um, sitting next to me at my right is, is Tom Wackerman. He's one of the owners of uh, Applied Science and Technology. Um, I've worked with him in the past on a similar project, and I asked him in here because he's a much better presenter than I am um, to walk you through what the project was and actually what the final product is. So, um, You've been with me so long, it, it's a new name, ASTI Environmental. What did I call it? Applied Science and Technology, which is what it was from 1985. But. <laughs> yeah, I think you were in grade school. You were in grade school in 1985. Um, Mayor, council, uh, persons, thank you very much for the opportunity to present this. I'm going to be very brief, but so compelling that you're going to want to get a copy of the report from Derek and read it tonight. Um, oh, you already have it. You probably already read it, in which case I'll be even briefer. Um, the environmental market is changing, and how municipalities approach properties for environmental issues is changing. It used to be a popcorn approach where you looked at one site and then you looked at another site, whether that was for benefits or whether that was for environmental contamination. But now it's becoming more coordinated. It's becoming part of an overall planning process. And that's not only important in terms of how you look at your community, but it's important in terms of your access to future grant dollars. And so the city of Ferndale, by doing this, is kind of on the cutting edge of that in, and will be positioning themselves not only in in terms of these particular 192 properties and hopefully redeveloping them, but also in terms of being positioned for future grant applications where they're looking for area-wide uh, coordination of environmental issues as well as planning, as well as redevelopment. So I, I think this is an important uh, move for the city to, to position themselves for that. There's a couple of objectives to these, and yes, Derek is right, it is, it is to help developers. Um, and understand what's going on on an individual piece of property. But I think most importantly, it's about understanding what's going on on a piece of property relative to the properties around it. Understanding how you take an area and, and position it for redevelopment. Um, I'll jump right to the conclusions, and, and that is you've got some great areas here. When we do this in other cities, we always find a lot of warts and a lot of skeletons in the closet, and you don't have a lot here. You've got high, you've got uh, high build out, you've got high occupancy, and you've got very few impediments, at least environmental impediments, to redevelopment in these areas. Um, another um, kind of uh, um, item in in doing this is that it's designed to identify kind of those skeletons in the closet. Uh, sometimes when people look at an industrial area or they look at an area with landfills or they look at an area that has been um, uh, functionally obsolete or blighted, they just assume that there are problems there. And so one of the things we try to do is identify those properties that don't have problems where you can get your biggest bang for your buck and you can start there and then work through the others. In your case, they're all really good. And there's only a couple of areas that will be problematic. They're already being dealt with by other companies, so I think you're well on your way to fixing those. And so um, in the um, map up at the top there, uh, one of the things that we provide is an interactive layered map. Uh, this is the Ronald Reagan School of Economics. Green is good, yellow is not so good, red's not as good as, as yellow. And you can see right away, much of the area has a very high redevelopment potential relative to environmental impacts. Um, this, is, this is very good for future development, and this is good for uh, putting these um, in the forefront and getting people interested in looking at them. I want to very quickly just look at one parcel and give you kind of an example of what this is all about. Um, we numbered the parcels arbitrarily, and you'll notice parcel number one, which is the long, thin parcel um, up along here, along the railroad track. 
this is two areas, both uh, on either side of Nine Mile Road. We call them the north and the south area in the report. But I just want to use Parcel 1 as an example for no other reason than it's got a lot of issues and a lot of interesting stuff going on with it. The idea here is to use publicly available information, not to go on the property, uh, not to do any borings, not to collect any samples, but just bring together all of the publicly available information about the properties in order to get an idea of what's going on on individual properties and what may be going on on adjacent properties. This, of course, in no way replaces a phase one, phase two, or due diligence or anything like that. The idea is simply to look from 30,000 feet and get an idea of what's going on with properties for positioning for redevelopment. And so we always start with um, the, the kind of the normal. There's the uh, former railroad lines, which become recognized environmental conditions on any given property and may or may not be an issue, uh, but are always brought up in terms of future investigation. And so on this particular property, it has a couple of, of challenges relative to those. Uh, we look at underground storage tanks, and you can see one popping up down between property, property 60 and 61. There's actually quite a few there, uh, but there's a suspected one to the north. We also look at um, other underground storage tank areas where there may or may not be underground storage tanks based on records that are incomplete or records that, that are partial or simply listings that we have found. Um, and then um, we take a look at uh, properties that have identified underground storage tanks on them, and those would be those yellow uh, pluses that show up over there. And as you can see, there are a number of different issues on here from on this parcel, this example parcel, uh, from those databases. Uh, but we go a little bit further and we take a look at what are called solid waste management units uh, and then identify what those issues particularly are. Now, you can't really read that. I could zoom in a little bit uh, more. That may be a little bit too much. And you can see some of the types of things that go on on this property. And, of course, the perception would be, look at all of the little boxes, this must not be a good idea. But when you look at the redevelopment potential, especially for this property, it becomes yellow, which is very doable, which is something you can, you can fix with engineered controls, administrative controls, some additional investigation. And, and so this is the, the kind of objective of the product, is to allow you to kind of understand what it is that you have in terms of environmental impacts. And so we looked at, at parcel one, but look across the railroad track at parcel three, and you begin to understand the adjacency of these properties. Every property affects every other property um, it, when it comes to environmental, either through, through transport or through perception. And so this allows uh, Derek, if somebody says, uh, wow, I'm really interested in your parcel number 30, uh, Derek can take a look at parcel 30. He can drill down through the data. He can begin to understand not just um, what it is that's going on in that parcel. But if we go back to parcel one, there's all the individual boring locations from the phase two investigations. So you can understand the extent of the data and the data gaps and, and those kinds of things. So it becomes a planning tool. So in, in summary, uh, this puts you in a position to, to begin adding this to your traditional planning uh, process, which of course has become more and more important over time, not only in terms of environmental cleanup and environmental protection and public health, but also in terms of incentives that are available to brownfields, but now also in terms of grants. The EPA has specifically said this. It also provides you with the ability to look at individual parcels and understand their adjacencies and gives you a concept of the data gaps and kind of the, the hurdles that you're going to have to, to jump through uh, to get to redevelopment. Um, this is, is um, addable, and so as you go along and you get more information, you can build these layers. We will provi be providing those GIS layers to, to Derek so he can add them to your GIS system, and it just becomes a very useful tool. We've rolled this out in about eight different communities, and already in some of those communities, it's being used exactly that way. Somebody says, I'm interested in Parcel 31, tell me about it. And because you can tell them about it, you keep the conversation going. Because you can tell them about it, you can help them envision which is always the biggest challenge, envision what that property may look like. Show one of the individual property sheets, too. Um, should be able to get there from here. Uh, each individual property is linked back to an individual property summary sheet, which is what you see up here for property number one, which takes all the known information and, and, and some of the suspected information when you get to recognize environmental conditions. Uh, and puts it all in one place. So it's very simple to hand this now to a prospective buyer and say, well, this is what the public record says. Now you've got to go out and do your, your due diligence, but this gives you a start. Great. Great. Other questions of counsel? Thank you very much. Yes. Oh, yeah. I love it. I love it. I love it. And my first question, um, Derek, and 
don't take this the wrong way because I want to buy it for you if you don't have it, is do you have the GIS tools right now to use and maintain this system? We're putting them together, yes. Okay. I, I believe so. And, and if we don't, the, the, the city manager has already indicated to, to provide a list of the things we need. But so what far, I think we're in good shape and, and going to be able to put this together, yes. Fantastic. Let me put a spin on that. This is a, this is a PDF-based product, and so it's available to put on your website. You can use it on any computer that has PDF. But so to update it, he needs yeah. to RTIS. update it, and that's yeah. the next step. But right. right now, it's usable by anybody. Yeah. Exactly. To so update it, he needs the, the RGIS. Yeah, that my next question was... Um, when, it, when it came to all of your overlays, um, you know, how would we make it accessible? I think uh, we may have just answered that. And then also, um, you've got the zoning districts um, yes. already built in. And I wonder um, if we could go through this at the next planning commission meeting or perhaps you know, set a special meeting time to do it if we have a big agenda next time. Sure. Um, because looking at these zoning districts, my first thought was, are our uses too intense? Are they not intense enough? Do they fit with the redevelopment potential for these sites? If we have sites that are cleaner than, they, than we thought they were, perhaps they are, you know, suited for things that we didn't initially think they were. Maybe we kept something heavy industrial that could potentially have a different sort of... No, I think that's a great way to look at it, and that's, and that's really why um, I'm a big fan of this tool and, and thought it was appropriate here, was it? Because it helps you establish a baseline. Um, it kind of takes you out of the dark a little bit. It puts all the information in one place, uh, eliminates some of the fear of the unknown. Um, when the Planning Commission does go through its planning process, Master Land Use Plan process, it can really reevaluate this area with a lot more information um, and, and make exactly that type of determination. So that hopefully that is one of the end results of it. You just got the zoning nerd on council really excited. It's <laughs> great. Any other questions? Yeah, I was wondering, um, I think this is fantastic too. Love it. I geek out on it as well. Yes. Um, um, but I was wondering, um, looking forward, as you look at um, targeting industries to um, come here to look at these parcels as you ramp up your marketing side of uh, attracting redevelopment, what type of industries um, are best suited for coming into our community? And I know part of that is looking at green, green. Uh, technologies, um, and how does this fit into that? But, like most communities in Oakland County, we, we piggyback on Oakland County's Emerging Sectors program. Um, they've done a lot of information, or a lot of research and a lot of, uh, spent a lot of time identifying the, the uh, areas that they feel are most appropriate for them as a county and, and us included in that county to focus on coming in. Ferndale specifically, I mean, I think we have a great start. We have companies like Garden Fresh. We have entrepreneurs that are working in, you know, the artisan distillery and, you know, bee nectars and Valentine vodkas. I think it, Ferndale has the real potential to focus on that type of specialty um, green, if you, if for lack of a better term, uh, food manufacturing distribution type centers. Um, we have some great examples of it here already. We have some small companies that are growing um, that are on both the city and the, the county and the MEDC's radar for, as those secondary type companies. Um, Outside of Oakland County standard emerging sectors, I think that's the one where maybe we really have a, a leg up on some other areas and, and could spend some time focusing on. Thanks. Okay. And also, just to make sure, um, as we share this with potential property purchasers or redevelopers, um, I, I imagine that there are some property owners or business owners who would be really surprised that we've been able to put together this much information on the site that they might own that they have no idea what is going on there. Um, it may be useful, as as you mentioned, you had a manufacturing business already that you were able to help expand. They didn't think they could. Um, so this may be, a, we may have light bulbs going off um, all over town with your economic gardening strategy um, when people see that, wow, actually, you've been able to show me exactly where the buried underground storage tank is so I can plan around it. Yeah, and we hope so. We, yeah. As we go out and meet with companies, we hope uh, obviously this gives us a much better idea of the information when we're walking in the door, um, not walking in and then having to chase it um, after that meeting. So it certainly gives us a leg up. That's great. Very good. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks, it. Tom. Um, our next order of business this evening is a public hearing. Um, uh, public hearing on the 2011 sidewalk replacement program. 
consideration to confirm the assessment role for special assessment sidewalk district 2011 and to spread the special assessments on the 2011 winter tax roll unless granted a deferment by the hardship committee i am going to call this public hearing to order is there anyone from the public who would like to address council this evening on our 2011 sidewalk replacement program Yes, sir. Just come on right up to the mic and uh... I'll be the first one, I guess. Please. Uh, my name is Dennis Steinhauser. I'm a homeowner at uh, 2020 East Troy. Uh, I've already had uh, the, my sidewalks repaired and replaced uh, from the, the company that did it. Uh, my problem is that uh, I have uh, a problem with a five uh, square section it's low and it collects water there and uh, I have um, a problem with that because I might have a problem with uh, slip and falls in the in the winter time if that you know gets wet and freezes and then I'll be the one that'll be uh, uh, liable for it I have pictures that I took and I don't know if this Your is the right again sir 2020 East Troy 2020 East Troy um. Sherlyn can take the pictures. Um, Byron, I, I'm going to. Byron, if you're back there, I see. You. I'm going to look at you. Is there is there a way that we could? Is it is it? We we'll check that out. Yeah, we'll make sure we have your address, we sir. Need his phone number. Okay, sir. So that's our Department of Public Works oh, Director, okay. Byron Fatidi. If you make sure he has your phone number, he'll send someone out to take a look at it. All right. Uh, I only made one copy of the pictures, which she has. I don't know if she wants to give them to him or whatever. Oh, okay. Yep. That's my only problem, and then uh, I have the bill and everything here. I don't know if this was r the right form or the right uh, time to do all that, but that's what I looked at uh, the letter here that I got. So, uh, well, not to pay the bill tonight, but um, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> to express your concerns about the assessment. Yes. All right. So then I'll talk to him, and then he'll contact me, and we'll please do. Yes, and he'll out. make he'll make sure to have all someone right. out there. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate it. Anyone else for this public hearing? Nope. All right. Seeing no one else, I will close the public hearing. Uh, and I will ask counsel if there are any discussions or questions that they have this evening about the 2011 assessment program. I'll just be interested to see how this new company does. That's sort of a similar complaint to the ones that we had with our previous company, so hopefully they're fewer and further between. I would move to confirm the assessment role for Special Assessment Sidewalk District 2011 and to spread the special assessments to the 2011 winter tax roll unless granted deferment by the Hardship Committee. Support. Uh, moved by Baker, supported by Galloway. Are there any other comments or discussion on that item? If not, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Council Member Scalloway? Yes. Tiana? Yes. Baker? Yes. Mayor Coulter? Yes, thank you. That item passes. Our next order of business is called audience. I appreciate our audience's patience this evening. It took us a little longer than usual to get here. But as you know, call to audience is 30 minutes now. More time needed if we need it uh, later after the meeting. Three minutes to say whatever you'd like to say about something that's not on the agenda. Uh, please state your name and address for the record or write it on the back sheet for our city clerk's benefit. Mr. Hopner, good evening. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. My name is Dennis Hopner. I live at 766 Flower Hill in Ferndale. It saddens me that we as American citizens have so much apathy for the thousands of lives around the world that are lost in fighting for the freedom to elect officials of their choice. They are jailed or shot because they dare to protest. One bright spot, as you may have seen on the news tonight, is the country of Tunisia. The people who started the Arab Spring shared one of its earliest fruits on Sunday, a free election. Tunisians who brought down a dictator nine months ago waited for hours to select those who will help shape their fledgling democracy. It was the first free election in the history of Tunisia. One citizen even said 
I, if I had to stand in line for 24 hours, I would not give up the chance to savor this air of freedom. They expect 90% of registered voters, that's 90%, to vote. In America, we have the right to protest and even recall elected officials. In some elections, only 10 to 15 percent of the registered voters go to the polls on election day. So I ask the voters of Ferndale on November 8th, do not take your freedom and your rights for granted. Go to the polls and vote for the candidate of your choice. Thank you. Well said, sir. Anyone else for call the audience? County Commissioner. Yes, Mr. Mayor, real quick once again, uh, this time as uh, your County Commissioner, uh, briefly, uh, you may have heard this, but it was pretty surprising up in uh, Pontiac. We managed to support, with some help from Councilwoman Piana, uh, for the first time ever, uh, the Regional Transit Authority uh, resolution. And we were very, very pleased with that. We were surprised. Some of us were surprised that it passed. Uh, it was not unanimous. It was about 21 to 4. But we had Republicans join all of the Democrats in supporting that. So I wanted to report that to you. I also did introduce a, a fracking moratorium. I think this body has also adopted a, a moratorium. That's bottled up in committee, but we'll see uh, if we can have a streak going. I do want to mention also, uh, as a new president of the Ferndale Youth Assistance that our annual Bolathon is this coming Sunday. Uh, Sunday, October 30th from 1 to 4 p.m. at uh, Luxury Lanes here in downtown Ferndale. We still have room if people would like to bowl. This is a pretty important fundraiser for Ferndale Youth Assistance that helps young people at risk uh, through the schools and the courts. If people are interested in bowling this Sunday, you uh, can join a team, you can join my team, you can just come out and have some fun, make a donation. The phone number for information at Ferndale Youth Assistance is 248-586-8700. And the last item, uh, some of you have seen this in the newspaper, but uh, at the request of some neighbors and residents in Ferndale, some of us have gotten together and we're going to, uh, as Dennis mentioned, uh, put on an old-fashioned protest. Uh, this coming Friday, the 28th of uh, October, we are going to join many people across the planet who have actually joined in on the 99%, uh, we are the 99% Occupy protests. Uh, these are residents of Ferndale. Uh, Dennis, as a matter of fact, who just spoke, is going to be one of our peacekeepers. But it's, uh, it's strictly uh, uh, a protest. We aren't camping out. There will be no sleeping, no camping, no tents. Some of us are too old to do that, but uh, especially in October, November. But uh, from 4 to 7 p.m., we welcome anyone, council members, welcome to come. Uh, and it's simply, again, to sort of demonstrate our solidarity with uh, marchers across the country that are saying that uh, working people in the middle class need to be represented, that the American dream seems to be slipping away a little bit that we want our government and our national leaders to get along, to compromise with each other, to focus on jobs, and to uh, don't forget the working person. So it should be pretty fun and creative. With Ferndale residents, I expect we're going to get lots of color and lots of interesting signs and flags, and people can bring drums or horns or saxophones or whatever they like. So, Mr. Mayor, I'd love to have you there come as well. Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you Commissioner. Sherry Wells, 315 West Troy. This is not my rotary hat, it's an apron because Rotarians work locally and all over the world. Uh, what we've done this past Thursday, we had a strategic planning session. We had Rotarians as facilitators, ones from Troy, Wixom, uh, the former mayor of Ann Arbor, Ingrid Sheldon, and our district governor for the Rotarian uh, area in this. Uh, Oakland County, parts of Canada even, it's a broad area. We also had Ferndale Movers and Shakers as our guests, <clears throat> Jennifer Rosenberg of the Ferndale Area Chamber, Jody Knittel, a small business coach, her business is Tangerine Road, Sharon Stahl of Gage Products, April McGrath, city manager, 
uh, Ed Burns from the Ferndale Public Library, Allie Darren of Allie Darren Photography, and the indomitable Ann Heller. And at the end of that strategic planning, <coughs> facilitators said that Ferndale will be amazed because what we were supposed to do is to write a report as if it were 2016 and say what we've done in five years. <coughs> we're having a, a follow-up session this coming Thursday. I'm really looking forward to that because that will be a more specific planning on the ideas that we brainstormed and chose. <coughs> the second thing is we now have a new custom with our Ferndale Rotary. This will be our second year <clears throat> that we are having a uh, Veterans Day program a week in advance of Veterans Day to help remind people what Veterans Day is all about. It's not about a sale. It's about the veterans. And for the second time, we are honoring three local veterans with a quilt of valor. This is an organization that started with a woman in Michigan, it's gone nationwide. They've done hundreds of quilts that they have given to veterans. In fact, one of them, when he was airlifted out of Afghanistan, had his quilt on his lap when he was loaded onto the airplane. Uh, this is something that is an invitation only because we have the veterans and their families and some specific organizations that we invite. But I am very proud of what we are doing. We've had two or three speakers in the past year about veterans. We are learning a lot more and we all need to include them a lot more when they come back, especially in our lives, so that they get some socialization, some respect, some feeling of belonging back home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, as some of you know, this past Saturday, the Ferndale Recreation Department and the Ferndale Area Chamber hosted um, our Hilton Fall Festival. All over a thousand people came out to enjoy the day's activities, including carnival games, hay rides, pony rides, costume contests, hunt tent, a rock climbing wall, inflatable obstacle course, and much more. Um, a big thank you to all of our volunteers. We certainly appreciate their hard work and wouldn't have been able to do it without their help. Um, a special thank you to all of our sponsors, our presenting sponsor, Garden Fresh Gourmet, our platinum sponsor, Gage Products, gold sponsor, Haja Subaru, our hayride sponsor, DTE, pony ride sponsor, Grand Central Self Storage, and printing sponsor, Credit Union One. Some of our additional sponsors include Revolution Signs, Oakland County Parks and Recreation, Southeast Oakland Coalition, Premium Electric, Vogue Vintage, Cladaw Chiropractic, Ferndale Schools, M1 Studios, CBiz Solutions, Lenny's Happy Center, Polly Peltier Productions, Snap Fitness, Temper Mill Studios, RNS Resale, Spalding and Curtain, Tube Source, Luxury Lanes, the Law Offices of Adrian Watts, Bits and Pieces, Small Business Solutions, and CNG Carpet Cleaning. The generosity of these businesses um, is greatly appreciated and um, is the reason we we're able to offer this wonderful um, full day of activities for the families in this community at a low cost. So, thank you. Thank you. It was a very fun event. Uh, the city manager and I had the opportunity to, to judge the Halloween costume contest. It was a whole I lot of fun. I had the pet costume contest. Oh, oh that's that was a fun <laughs> Great event and nice weather too. So uh, really nice, really nice event. Thanks, folks. Good evening. Hi, good evening. I'm Helena Rosen with the FESC. I have a green tip for everybody tonight. And our green tip is to just let residents know about a few opportunities that the city is making available for everyone in November. Um, I think Chris Hughes was talking about some stuff that DDA is doing with DPW and SACRA to get businesses to recycle more. And they're also doing some things to get residents to increase recycling as well. Um, and right now our recycling rate is actually the highest it's been in the last 10 years, probably the highest ever. Um, but I've only looked at the last 10 years at 8.55%, which is the good news. Um, however, out of the other communities that SACRA serves, which there's 12 altogether, we're still third from the bottom in recycling rates. We're only above Hazel Park and Oak Park right now. Um, just to give you an idea, um, Hazel Park's rate is about 6%, and Huntington Woods is the top with 19%. Just to give everyone an idea of the potential and ranges, um, so this is important because um, our low recycling rate is putting our city at a disadvantage because I don't, not every resident knows that um, for every ton 
of recycling that we get picked up, SACRA rebates the city now $37.50. It was $30, now it's $37.50. So last fiscal year, we, the city was rebated almost $36,000 off of a $379,000 disposal expense. It's almost a 9% savings. So the more we recycle as a city, the larger our re rebate will be. Um, so city is providing some opportunities in November. First of all, recycling bins are going to be half off for the whole month of November, and you can get your bin at the city yard on East Camborne. They're normally $12, so it's a pretty, pretty good bargain. Um, That's worth repeating. Say that again so that all the residents understand. November. <laughs> Sorry, I know I'm talking really fast. No, that's, that's an important point. If you don't have a recycling bin and you didn't want to get a new one because you didn't want to pay the $12 fee, there's going to be a half-off special, right? And the right. dates are? Oh, it's just it's all the whole month of November. For the month of November, you can get a half-off a recycling bin mm -hmm. if you don't have one. Either. Or if you need additional ones. Or if yes. you need additional ones, which or I actually do. if you want to buy one for a gift with the holidays coming up. <laughs> makes a lovely holiday yeah. gift. I have a question. It really does. Can, they only go at DPW, right? You can only pick them up at Actually, D you can get them at Sakura as well. You um, need to bring proof of residency. But I did yes? see. I'm pretty sure I saw on there. Well, I was wondering if we can get some businesses to actually help sell them at, I don't know, maybe because it's difficult to get to DPW during your day, oh, during open business yeah. hours. So, you know, that's another thing that <laughs> is going to happen in November, too, that the DPW is going to be addressing, because that is a big problem. The hours are um, kind of inconvenient for people who have a 9 to 5. So November 8th at the Fernhill Public Library from 6.30 to 8, you can come and actually order a bin at the off-city hours, and they will bring the bin to your home. Free of charge. So yeah, six bucks. How about that? Free delivery. And home delivery. <laughs> yeah, so Let's give that date again. November eighth. November eighth. At the Fernhill Public Library. Um, it happens to be going on uh, during an FESC event also involving the DPW and SACRA. They're gonna be hosting a recycling one oh one for people who might want to come and have any questions about recycling, something maybe you need help getting started or you've been kind of confused about what's recyclable and what's not. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's about it. Just given the interest in the environment with the residents and now the city, it's just a really great time to everyone can work together to increase recycling and lower our expenses and increase our quality of life here or maintain it the way it is. Well, right. and, and I want to thank the FESC. When, when the article first was published, I believe in the patch, that our recycling rates were so low, I talked with Douglas Christie and said, what can your group do to help spur ideas to increase it? And I think these are just the beginning ideas and yeah. some other creative things that he's thinking about to help I us encourage residents to, to recycle. So I thanks for I think that if, you know, the businesses getting involved and with the DPW and just being able to maybe think outside the box and as far as getting these numbers up, I really think that we're probably going to be seeing some changes with the next uh, fiscal year, which is July of 2012. We'll Thanks. be able to see. Appreciate all the help. Thank you. Anyone else for public, I uh, mean, for a uh, call to audience this evening? We need to have competitions, like block competitions. <laughs> <laughs> right. Bowfield would do good. No one else for call to audience this evening? Then I will close call to audience. Thanks, everybody. Our next item of business is the consent agenda. These are items that are considered routine by the city council, and we enact them all in one motion unless something is removed from the consent agenda. Uh, let me read it for you. Uh, item A, approval of the minutes of the regular meeting held October 10, 20, uh, 2011. B, approval to adopt the resolution of appreciation for retiring auxiliary officer Ken Brown C, approval of the $3,939 invoice from Fellner Electronic Laboratories of Ann Arbor uh, for a Niagara 2100 two encoder and software support package to provide programming to the AT&T UVerse cable subscribers. Approval of the Interlocal Damage Assessment Mutual Aid Agreement with the Oakland County Building Officials Association. Approval to extend the minor electrical services contract with BNS Electrical of Ferndale through August 11th of 2013. 
and approval of the bills and payrolls is certified by our city manager to be paid subject to the review of the Council Finance Committee. Uh, are there any items to be removed from the consent agenda this evening? I would move that we adopt the consent agenda in its entirety. Sure. Moved by Galloway, supported by Baker. Are there any discussions on these items? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Council members Piana? Yes. Baker? Yes. Galloway? Yes. Mayor Coulter? Yes, thank you. The consent agenda is adopted. Um, now on to the regular agenda. We have just one item this evening. The appointment of Cable Administrator slash Deputy City Clerk Marnie McGrath as Representative and City Manager April McGrath as alternate, alternate representative to the interlocal, intergovernmental, excuse me, Cable Communications Authority. Is there a motion? I move to appoint Cable Administrator, Deputy City Clerk, Marnie McGrath to the City's Representative and City Manager April McGrath, the City's Alternate Representative to the Intergovernmental Cable Communications Authority Board. Is there support? Support. Sorry. Uh, moved by Piana, we'll say it was supported by Baker. Uh, any discussion on this item? Madam Clerk. Council members Baker? Yes. Galloway? Yes. Yana? Yes. Mayor Coulter? Yes, thank you. Uh, that appointment, those appointments are approved. Our next order of business would be call to council, and I see our police chief. Anything else for the good of the community this evening, chief? Just one quick one, Your Honor. I'm not really a big a cat fan. <laughs> Paul didn't work. <laughs> um, not if you put B, it was supposed to go up. No, I all I have is Sorry, um, I was to that. <laughs> on November fifth. Uh, Commissioner Covey did mention this, but that is our annual um, auxiliary dinner. That is open to anybody if, that would like to RSVP to my secretary. The phone number is two four eight five four six two three eight eight, and it is the event that we. Um, Honor those people that put in so many hours to help us do uh, many of the things that we couldn't do without them for these special events. All of you, of course, are invited. We've already, the city manager has already RSVP'd. As have I, Chief. I'll be there. Well, then I won't take you off the list, uh, Your Honor, of the people that I'm looking at here. <laughs> <laughs> but that's all I have to Make that public noted. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. Uh, Byron, anything else for the DPW department this evening? Uh, I wanted to talk about that time of year for leaf collection. We started last week. Um, we got the um, west side done, and we're now on the east side. And this time of year usually takes us a week turnaround. Um, and then as the um, as it gets heavier, it's usually a seven eight day turnaround to do the entire city. So if you can, you know, if we if we're not in your area that one week will be in the following week and we usually average about seven eight um, citywide collections and then we do ask that when you do rake your leaves out try and rake them about a foot off the curb so we can continue the drainage um, especially when we get late in the season we get a lot of wet weather and um, the streets don't drain and we've got ponding and then um, the leaves are harder to pick up so if everybody could remember that I don't, have, I don't have anything else. Thank you. Thanks, Byron. Appreciate it. Derek, uh, anything else for the department? department? All right. Anything else from the Recreation Department this evening? All right. Thank you. Uh, Cheryl Lynn, anything going on in the clerk's office? <laughs> As a matter of fact, Your Honor, there is. Two weeks from tomorrow is our um, municipal election for Mayor City Council and Library Board and in the Precincts 8 and 9 for the Hazel Park School Board. Um, so if you are not going to be able to get to the polls in person on November 8th, please contact the city clerk's office or stop by, pick up an absentee ballot. Let your voice be heard. Thank you. Is there a deadline for the absentee? Saturday, November 5th at 2 p.m. Our office will be open that Saturday by law, as it always is the Saturday before an election from 9 a.m. until 2 p.m. And up until 2 p.m., you can get an absentee ballot. And actually, you can come in on the day before the election, get an absentee ballot up until 4 p.m., but you cannot leave the building with it. You have to vote it here and leave it here. Okay? Good. Good to know. Thanks. 
City Manager April McGrath. A couple things. I first want to say um, that we received a beautification award again from the Eight Mile Association for all of our beautiful um, greenery and shrubbery that we have on Eight Mile. And I want to say thank you to Byron for allowing us to get the second year in the row. Um, I remember on my tour that I came for when I was. Um, doing my interview that he was very clear that he was very proud of making sure that we knew when we were in Ferndale and it's very apparent and it's not gone unnoticed so thank you very much Byron for taking the time and the energy to make sure that all parts of our community look as well as they can so we just want to say thank you to him for all of his hard work on that um, another thing I want to talk about is that at the next council meeting on November 14th I am requesting to start at 6 p.m. if we could um, for a work session, study session. Um, you asked for them, you will now get them. <laughs> I think we're going to have about one a month for a little while. This will focus will be on revisiting parking. I think back in December, you had a presentation on parking, and we want to bring that back and start that conversation again and continue it. Um, so this will be probably a series of a couple of meetings, but we do ask that if it's possible, if we could um, confirm it, whether or not we could start at 6 o'clock next Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, November 14th, to begin that conversation. Is that something that will work for all of you? I mean Monday? Oh, Monday, I'm sorry, yes, okay. Monday the 14th. <laughs> okay, so we'll start that process and more, more information to come on that. Um, that it very much be conversation that evening and just information gathering and things of that nature. So there'll be no action taken at that meeting. And is that here again? It will be here. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we'll just go right into the regular scheduled meeting at 7.30. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk a little bit more about is um, that we, staff is wrapping up, gathering our materials and our information that we want to start promoting um, our uh, non-technology focused communication plan. Um, and we'll be unveiling that next week. We'll have a two week period of a media campaign that will talk about how we're communicating with our residents um, when it, it much more focused on lack of technology. So the whole get go where you vote for your note. And um, this is just going to be one part of our communications plan. And this is really the part that uh, focuses on when technology has failed the city and how do we communicate with our residents. So they'll be um, starting next week, Wednesday or Thursday, I think is my starting of my campaign and will end on November 14th. And we'll be doing as much media campaigning as we can with uh, press releases, our website, um, communicating through other channels as necessary as well. We have a big list of places we want to get this information out, as well as a consistent list of um, how we can continually get that message out, and it's just not during this campaign blitz. But we thought it was appropriate to do it during the election season, as that's kind of where we're focusing people on going for their information. So, um, Council, you'll get some of that information ahead of time just to have a chance to take a look at it. But um, starting uh, next Wednesday, we will start our campaign blitz and get a hold of all of the, the media outlets that we have to help us promote this new uh, part of our communications plan. And there will be more to come on that as well. So. So again, with that, uh, next time we meet, we'll be here at 6 p.m., please. Everybody, I saw the yeses, so we'll go forward with that. That's all I have. City Attorney, Dan Christ, anything this evening? Uh, just uh, an update. Uh, I will, given the increased interest in uh, peddling, peddlers and peddler, oh. peddling in the city, I will be providing additional materials to the city clerk with respect to that issue and various alternatives as she and her committee starts exploring that issue for next year. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Kate Baker, anything this evening? The Hilton Fall Festival was a blast. I was there later in the day uh, with my parents and my niece. She is uh, she's nearly four and loves that bounce house climbing it was a mud fest it was it was crazy over there but all the kids they didn't care they loved that their socks were covered in mud and that they were climbing through the bounce house so thank you to, um, to, to Jill Julie and Jeff um, as well as the team from the um, Chamber of Commerce for putting on an event that that is really uh, family focused and and appeals to kids of all ages when a three or four year old can have fun and then I saw sort of you know tweens hanging out and having fun as well you don't often get that it's a, a really great event um, speaking of another great event Fern Care is having what I think might now be our third annual Volathon it's coming up on Sunday December the 4th it will be at Fernil's Luxury Lanes we have a, um, a, a 
I think the whole place booked a number of lanes, 12 or 14 um, lanes, and we just about filled the place up last year. Um, unfortunately, my uh, team will not be there this year, so someone needs to take my lane. Um, so I will be plugging this at every council meeting until Sunday, December the 4th. If you're interested in participating and bowling for Fern Care, there's more information on our website, ferncare.org, or you can email uh, Joanne Wilcock, the board member who is spearheading this particular project, at jwilcock, W-I-L-L-C-O-C-K, at ferncare.org. She can get you information on how to reserve a lane and the fundraising packet as well so that people can go out and collect pledges for Fern Care. That's it. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Galloway. Uh, just a couple of things this evening. Uh, the DDA mentioned that uh, the Red Hook uh, coffee shop is opening up where uh, Pinwheel was. Uh, also opening up uh, at that location is a pop-up restaurant, a restaurant that's going to be available uh, one night a week only. It's Indonesian cooking, and uh, it's called Komodo Kitchen, K-O-M-O-D-O, -O -O, kitchen.com, is where you can buy tickets. You have to buy them in advance. It's a fixed meal, and it's started by... Uh, Gina Onyx, who is a Ferndale resident. So uh, I don't think there's any Indonesian restaurants in town here, but she's a great cook, and I encourage folks to check that out. Uh, the first uh, meal is already sold out, and um, we have to sort of get on a list, so it's sort of a special thing. And of course, uh, this is the last meeting, of course, before the uh, election, encourage people to get involved and, and vote. Lots of good candidates out there. Thank you. Um, I'll go next, and I'm going to allow Councilwoman Piana to have the final say tonight because she has a short presentation for us. But I want to just once again thank the organizations and groups that helped me with the backpack program and apologize to those residents, and there were a lot of them, individuals who called me, emailed me, asking for <coughs> excuse me, a single individual backpack. Uh, it was just easier this year to go through four different organizations and have them adopt a whole classroom. But as we expanded, I have your names and I have your numbers, and I will get a hold of you. But thank you for your offering to do that. Uh, and finally, this is the last uh, council meeting before the election, so I think uh, Dennis said it probably more eloquently than we ever could, but please remember your right to vote on November the 8th. And now, Councilwoman Piano will let you have the final word this evening. Thank you. Um, I really only have one comment tonight, and it comes with five slides. Um, so I wanted to provide some information um, about some projects that everybody's hearing in the news um, on mass transit, transit transportation investment, um, complete streets master plan, and um, some work that I've been doing um, with the... Um, what? Oh, it just went. Oh, with the approval of um, city council as the as the liaison to this uh, task force. Um, so there's multiple projects, um, lots of partners, and I wanted to sort of set that straight today about um, how collaborative partnerships can lead to new um, opportunities, and these new opportunities are presenting themselves. Um, at the same time, um, new grant funding is um, being extended um, for investments along corridors, and Woodward Avenue is one of those corridors. So I wanted to talk today a little bit about what those are. Um, and my nice Venn diagram here um, is a fantastic way to describe the, um, I guess I should open up my own PowerPoint so I can look at it in front of me, hang on. So is to describe um, what is happening. And so first, I wanted to tell about um, the Woodward Avenue Action Association. They've been the nonprofit that we've been a member of for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. And they are the core economic development, community development nonprofit representing um, the communities along Woodward from Detroit uh, to Pontiac. And we've been uh, participating in their various programs um, uh, throughout the years. Um, as soon as I got elected last year with the support of Kate, um, a group of elected officials uh, decided to come together and create a task force to look at land use, coordinating land use between the communities from Ferndale to Birmingham. And that group of elected officials came together almost a year ago and they named themselves the Tran Transfer uh, Transit Oriented Development Task Force, what we've also called ourselves Transform Woodward. And We've been working on a shared corridor vision for the last year, um, starting since August of 2010. 
And then more recently, the one I am just super psyched about is the more recent announcement of the Federal Transportation Administration's $2 million um, alternative analysis um, transportation alternative study. So that $2 million looks at what type of mode should come past or could come past 8 Mile. Um, it could be bus rapid transit. It could be Woodward Light Rail. Um, however, this alternative analysis is the first step in the New Start's federal process, um, and it's a two-year study. And it has a pretty significant outreach component, and um, I wanted to just show you here that we have three different groups or three different initiatives um, through the Woodward Avenue Action Association, who is the core um, representative of economic development along the corridor, a transfer, Transform Woodward Task Force emerged, and we're looking at land use planning, uh, transit-oriented development principles, which I'll go through in a minute, and we're really looking at creating a shared vision for the corridor. And uh, through that work, we were able to put together a pretty competitive proposal um, to the FTA for this $2 million. And really, um, all the partners overlap, but we're really about creating um, and achieving a common goal um, for Woodward, so in the middle. And here is the uh, um, list of, it didn't go, oh, oh, sorry, you need to advance it, sorry. <laughs> it advanced in front of me, but not, not everybody else. Um, I wanted to uh, describe what the partnerships are um, um, as part of the Venn diagram. So the Woodward Avenue Action Association is sort of the nurturer facilitator of the TOD task force. So, the, so her board, uh, the board of directors of the WA3 um, approved a um, resolution appointing or um, recognizing formally the TOD task force members. And in the blue on the left are the communities and um, representatives along the corridor um, of who's sitting on that. And so Kate and I um, represent Ferndale. Two people are uh, Janet Ecker, who is the planning director, is the chair of our group, Steve Baker and um, Berkeley, Mayor Ellison, uh, Jeff Jenks and council, and uh, we have Smart Detroit Zoo and um, the Suburbs Alliance. We also have some support partners. So after we came together for the first time, um, SunCog, MDOT, and the Beaumont Hospital um, is really uh, are representing um, the task force. So we really kind of work as one unit now, um, but the elected officials are, are recognized just formally on paper um, as, as the coordinating uh, group. Um, and on the left hand, or on the right hand side, is the two million alternative analysis project. Um, the Pleasant Ridge um, opted out of the Woodward Avenue Action Association a couple years ago, so they have, um, um, while supportive of TOD and investments along the corridor, they have, um, haven't been participating on the task force, um, but I think that will change in the near future. Um, but when we apply for the $2 million alternative analysis, you'll see that the same people on the TOD task force, um, in terms of the elected officials, are representing the communities. And um, we have people who are on the TOD task force as part of support partners now become technical support partners. Um, with the $2 million alternative analysis. And the reason that is is that the government requires um, municipalities to be the grant grantees um, and that a government, um, a government unit had to apply. Um, and so those are the technical um, differences between, between um, the task force and the $2 million alternative analysis. So I will be representing Ferndale um, as sort of like a, a vote on the steering committee. And um, the technical support partners will also be uh, providing um, a lead. Or uh, so obviously, will be providing support to the whole overall initiative. And um, the difference with the L2 million that we also needed a agency to guide and funnel federal dollars. So you need a transportation agency to accept that money. Um, and SAMCOG is our... Um, our coordinating partner. Any questions about these two? So, and then um, I really just wanted to go over what we've accomplished, and this is what I'm really proud of, of what can happen in over a year of people coming together and building these relationships. And it really is um, tapping into the city's vision with economic gardening, improving the quality of life, 
um, and transit investment um, allows us to make those advances on behalf of the community. Um, and TOD, and since October we came together, we've um, approximately, well that should be 50000 so we've probably raised $75,000 um, between MDOT and ULI to do this to, the, to do the study, the TOD shared vision study, um, the top of the Venn, Venn diagram. And then um, we are partnering with the Lawrence Tech uh, University with their students, um, architectural students, to come up with some visual concepts of what TOD could look like um, on Woodward to help um, have conversations um, when we do uh, public outreach. And we have come up with um, draft TOD overlay zones, um, for the cities to consider and then in, in March um, we'll be bringing those plans to the city for um, consideration and adoption. So the, the first project that we started with a year ago is still ongoing and it will feed into and help um, anything that we do with the two million dollar term analysis um, which will start in the beginning of the year. So um, the, the, the transit study hasn't started yet. And, and then I wanted to go why TOD and just kind of give a brief, brief primer on this because um, we're going to be having more public conversations um, in a couple months about why this is important and, um, and, and sort of educate people on what TO me, TOD means for our community and for the corridor. And really um, just wanted to present the basics. Um, TOD is about building a place, it's not just about transit or light rail coming past 8 Mile. It's more than that. It's about connectivity um, and what I call mobility grid. You're connecting the mobility grid. Um, so it's about compact development, orientating buildings to the sidewalk. How are you improving pedestrian connections to the transit stops? Um, and you're also looking at providing uh, residential employment densities and uh, choices in um, different types of um, buildings. Um, one of the complaints that I hear frequently is that we don't have enough um, office space along the Woodward Corridor um, that is updated. And we're also looking at, uh, TOD is also looking at incentives um, to help spur redevelopment um, along the corridor. So those are just some basic transit oriented development principles called TOD. And then, oops, did I do Y TOD? So, um, did I miss that? I so, that um, sorry, sorry, I, I went to the slide ahead because I'm not looking behind me. Um, but really what TOD is, is um, really efficient land use and efficient transportation. And this is why people want transit investment because you, again, are going back and making better connections with the, the mil mobility grid. And we're doing, TOD helps um, achieve some results in for economic development, but also for the quality of life, which is two key areas that we're focusing on for the, uh, the Ferndale. So I've already mentioned um, uh, the, about private investment, compact, mi compact mixed use, um, you know, access to services and businesses, and really the quality of life, what I hear from our residents is they want more choices um, about getting around where they want to go, and people want to walk to where they where they um, want to get to as well. So we're creating a healthy lifestyle. Um, and the one thing that really, for me, out of all of improving the Woodward Corridor with transit improvements is that property near transit has a higher land value. So you're increasing the value of that property. And that's really about um, a core strategy for um, dealing with um, our declining housing prices, our declining property prices, and so that's why I see this as an important investment um, for our community. And then, um, sorry, I already did what is TOD. So um, I already went through that. Um, sorry about that. Um, I'm not looking behind me. And so I just wanted to sh share with people um, what that is. And then the next last slide um, about what to expect and how you can help um, with transforming Woodward is really just to start having conversations with your friends about what could uh, be different along the Woodward Corridor, not only for Ferndale, but also for the other communities, um, because we're going to have a, a pretty significant outreach component um, to the Transform Woodward Initiative through the t shared TOD, but also with the $2 million alternative analysis project. 
So start thinking and having conversations with your friends. And that's all I have. That's it? <laughs> that was great. Hey, I appreciate that. Uh, it obviously, it was in the news recently, the $2 million grant, which uh, Councilwoman Piana had a significant role in helping us to achieve. And you deserve uh, congratulations for that. Absolutely. And with that, our meeting is adjourned.